All right, thank you for showing up this evening and to another chapter. Now, this is going to be a talk on the wisdom of Heraclitus. Now, I'm using the word wisdom in the philosophical sense, and that's going to create, I hope, a problem. Because normally it is not regarded true that Heraclitus has any concepts dealing with that realm of the divine intelligence called wisdom. Now, if I can make this point, then we have to see how is it that there's such a sharp difference between what most people regard as Heraclitus and his thought and what we'll be doing tonight. That is to say, there's a primary problem in hermeneutics, that is, how to interpret things. So, let me start. Of course, he was born in, during the 69th Olympiad, that puts him at around 500 to 504 BC. We only have fragments of his work, that's all we have, found in other authors' writings, and therefore they're scattered throughout ancient literature. People bring them all together into a unity and then write commentaries on them. I would like to make a point about what I think is what I call the one to three and sometimes it's one to four ratio. That is, in each of the subjects he's going to explore, he says some things positive and they stand to the negative or to the sharp contrasts three to four. So therefore, as an example, if he's talking about the fundamental nature of things, he'll say three, four, three or four things positive, and he might say, on top of that, uh, 15 to 18 negative things or contrasts. Now, if you build up your view of what he's doing by the negatives, you miss the fact that his whole style is epigrammatic, right? and it deals with opposites and sharp contrasts. That's his style, so we have to see why he's doing that and the fact that he's doing it. And I have a couple of very good examples of this word, which we'll get to in a moment. All right, so now look here. Given this, we now have to take a look at this curious thing called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a term, right? Fancy word, used to describe method of interpretation or approach to interpretation. In the classic world, there are basically three. Now, the first is, <clears throat> like with Aristotle, there are some people who believe you can understand Aristotle just by staying in Aristotle, by Plato just staying into Plato. That's one approach to understanding the text. The second, however, is very heavily into the Pla ancient Platonic tradition. And what it does is say, no, 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 there's a whole tradition we can examine. And since there are many very fine thinkers who are exploring these early thinkers and important thinkers, what happens if we find a few really outstanding thinkers who can throw light on the early thinkers, as example? If we want to read Plato, we want to get into Plato, and there are some difficulties in Plato. What if we went through the tradition of Platonic literature and got into Proclus? Well, Proclus is a commentary on much of Plato, especially the Parmenides and other writings. And then if we can master that and go back and to read Plato, then it should illuminate Plato. To the degree that it does so, that's the second method of hermeneutical method of the ancients. Now, Pro Proclus talks about the fact that he studied with Serranius, who was a great Neoplatonist, didn't leave much in writing, if anything, fragments. But by working with him and understanding what he uh, grasped about Plato, he was able to put it into a structure, and those are the works we have. Th that's a different method. Um, Aristarchus is one of the great geniuses of the old days, and he did an exploration of Homer. He's one of the great authors on Homer. Now, what did that mean? That meant, therefore, when people in the older days wanted to get into Homer and they read him and enjoyed him, they might want to then check on Aristarchus to find out what he says about particular issues and then go back into Homer to see whether that illuminates things that may be a little obscure or difficult. Priscianus is another one who really has stated this method very clearly. And he did a work on uh, Aristotle's De Anima or the soul. Uh, 
and it's a very fine work. Priscianus did it. And in the introduction, Priscianus says, and he's third century, he said you can understand the idea of the soul in Aristotle much more clearly if you read the writings of Iamblichus. And therefore, what he did was to say, let me show you what I Iamblichus did with Aristotle's theory of the soul, and I will then add it and structure in such a way so that when you go back and read Aristotle, it will become clear to you. Now, the reason why I'm using Aristotle is because, like on the idea of the active and the passive intellect, there are only, really, only two paragraphs, and they're they're, they're difficult to read because the language is obscure, or they're only notes and they weren't really worked out. So therefore, Priscianus says, well, of course they were just notes for classroom work. Therefore, read Iamblichus, he'll put them together, he'll show you the insights and how to read them, and then Priscianus says, and I'll put them in a formal structure. Therefore, this is pretty much a statement of Priscianus' view. He says, before you do a work, an insight must be attained into the truth of the reality itself, whatever an author is talking about, the soul or the wisdom or whatever it is. An insight must be attained into the truth of the reality itself. And it should, must, include one's own investigations. And those investigations are to go thoroughly into the conception of those who have achieved the summit in knowledge on that particular subject. So that's what he did, you see. He reached an insight into the study of the soul by reading Iamblichus. That's one of the men who, in the ancient world, was said to have achieved the summit of knowledge in respect to this issue of the soul. So Priscianus read him, mastered it, and included his own investigations in respect to that. And that's the basis of his work. That's the second mode of hermeneutical interpretation. And we did say there were three. The third is what, Procl pardon me, what Plotinus and Sarianus does. They incorporate the work and use it as a vehicle for seeing themselves. It's not a scholarly treatment. It is opening up their own mind to this kind of exploration. And they are then the primary investigators and then through their own achievements, they then see things in a sharper way and therefore uh, can be said to develop their own kind of hermeneutics based upon their own reflections of the text and their own inner experiences. And they try to bring it together to throw light upon ancient authors whom are most important to them. Those are the three methods. Now, now that we're looking at Heraclitus, you see the modern way of doing things is the moderns have a hermeneutical approach, and primarily it's to go to Aristotle and find out what Aristotle thinks about Heraclitus, and then they represent that as the essence of Heraclitus. Therefore, we're going to test that later. And you're going to be the testing. You're going to do some testing. I have statements of Aristotle, all of them, uh, from his work on Heraclitus, and after we go through this talk, You'll be given those sheets, and you can just grade Aristotle, because you will be then in a position to judge how well he understood Heraclitus in terms of the whole 124, and you'll give him a grade. So tonight you're grading Aristotle. All right, that's where we're going. So now everything I say comes out of a whole 124 fragments, and Philip Wheelwright is the translator that I'm going to refer to. So first. This is what is most often referred to as the Heraclitus' view of nature or the processes in nature. Fire and water are the big two images that are used to explore the processes of nature. And he has two images, bow and arrow and the lyre, and he says, hey look, there are two forces pulling this way and pushing that way, and that tension between the two is the very vehicle that brings about all that is in nature. For all nature is nothing other conflict, strife, opposites clashing together. And that's normal, and that's real, and that's the nature of things. So he says, fire. Fire is the exchange of all things. Right? For all things become fire, and fire out of fire come all things. Fire 
throws things up and out, and it gathers things in. So there are two forces, you see, two forces. And then he has the way of understanding, if you now take this now, and the way in which we used the terms last week, these are not literal, right? The elements are not literal. They're principles that are represented by these terms. Therefore, fire lives in the depth of earth. Earth is anything solid. Earth is anything solid. So fire lives, right, in the depth of things that are burnable. Right? That's what it does. Fire lives in the depth of wood. Fire lives in, and since anything can be consumed in a hot enough fire, therefore fire lives in the depth of earth. Oh, huh, curiously enough, air lives in the depth of fire because out of the fire sweeps up air, lofty as it is, pushes up into the heavens. Right? And what happens with air? Why, uh, as notice we have an analogy, as fire lives in the depth of earth, so air lives <clears throat> in the depth of fire, as water lives in the depth of air, and as earth lives in the depth of water. Right? So these are processes. These are processes through which, see, these are, pro these are stages. These are all stages in the process of nature. Nature then goes through each transformative, and in that transformative aspect, he says, I think I know what that is behind it all. That's the principle of fire. And then, of course, he then takes his view with water, as, right? And he says, hey, you know what? The very flow of water, everything flows, nothing abides, everything changes. So he takes that view, which is very interesting. If you take, the, take a, a motion picture, right, of any process, speed it up or slow it down, you get a whole different view of the way in which the thing moves and grows. So if we could see in one month the whole evolution and destruction of the earth and our heavens, you would see something coming into being and passing out of being, much like a great flow. So he says everything flows, nothing remains in itself. Everything gives way to everything, nothing stays as it is. It's that very essence in the social condition is war. War is just nothing other than the same process going on in nature. It goes on endlessly at strife. Therefore, everything comes to pass through the compulsion of strife. Strife is natural. And therefore, in one day you can become a king, and the next day you can become a slave. Everything transforms. And he says, as you consider it, he says, that's why you can't step in the same river even once. The river changes, you can't step in the same river, it's changing, the water changes, everything changes. So you can't even say you step in the same river once, much less twice. This is his view of nature. What's at variance with itself is always with itself. So he, uh, I'm going to read a couple of quotes out of this section, which uh, I should have here. Yeah. Ah, good, 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 good. He's got one or two that I'm very fond of that, uh, for some reason, I'm not trusting my memory right now. The fairest universe is but a heap of rubbish piled up at random. Every beast is driven to pasture by a blow. Sun is new every day. The sun is the breath of a man's foot. It's all relative, it's all through stages. There is an exchange of all things for fire and a fire for all things as they are uh, wares for gold and of gold for wares, each exchange for the other. This entire universe, which is the same for all, has not been made by any god or man. It always has been, is, and will be. It's like an ever-living fire kindling itself by regular measures and going out by regular measures. See, there's still order behind this. Behind this, there's still measures. See, behind this is measures. There's still measures behind this, and therefore we have to go <clears throat> behind the process of nature to take a look at the order 
and that's where we're going. There are going to be levels of orders that are going to be disclosed, and that's the way we're doing it. <clears throat> so therefore, he now takes the next level, right? Next level. He says, look here, you have to realize <clears throat> that nature loves to hide. Nature loves to hide. You have to kind of understand it to see what's going on, for all of it is one. All is one. Major, philosoph major philosophical term. For look here, for out of the all, the many particular comes oneness. And out of oneness come the many particulars. Becoming unfolds as opposites, you see. And through all the transformations of fire, it goes into all the different transformations. We can see that we have to then discover what's behind this process of oneness, and that's where we're now going to go. Now, what is behind it all? Order, high degree of order, which he calls the logos. The logos, the principle of the logos, is eternally valid, eternally true. And it's according to the logos that all things come to pass. Now, most men are asleep to it. They think they have an intelligence, a private intelligence of their own. They don't realize that it's the Logos that is the primary intelligence. And although these people are intimately connected with it, the Logos, uh, men keep setting themselves against it. They are asleep. Hey, you know what? They seem to be without experience of it, yet they're in the midst of it. Now he contrasts that with his own way and he reveals his method. Because what you have to grasp about nature and the principle behind it is the first thing is that you have to look for what is common to all. It's my method is easy to see, so it's very simple. First he says, I have searched myself. Primary, I've searched myself. And my method is that I study each thing according to its nature. And then I want to specify how it behaves. I want to see how it behaves. I want to study it. I want to specify its nature. I want to see what it does. Because of that, he says, of the things I love, sight is principle, hearing, but learning is what I most love. So in order to specify how things behave, you have to use sight, the senses. But it is on a higher level because you're trying to reach the truth about nature. So therefore, he has this lovely statement which I now would like to read to you. Although the Logos is eternally valid, yet men are unable to understand it, not only before hearing it, but even after they've heard it for the first time. That is to say, Although all things come to pass in accordance with its logos, men seem to be quite without any experience of it. At least if they're judged in the light of such words and deeds as I am setting forth. Now my own method is to distinguish each thing according to its nature and to specify how it behaves. Other men, on the contrary, are, are as, a, as neglectful of what they do when awake as they are when asleep. Therefore, we should be guided by what is common to all. Yet although the Logos is common to all, most men live as if each of them had a private intelligence of his own. Therefore, men who love wisdom should become acquainted with a great many particulars. Well then, how does this idea of the Logos fit within his scheme? It's certainly a principle that's behind and therefore with which all things uh, accord. Therefore, he goes to another level. He goes to another level. Watch this level. He says, there's a hidden harmony. That's the problem. There's a hidden harmony. And our job is we have to know the intelligence behind that. We have to understand that intelligence by which all things are steered through all things. Look here. Hey. Things as they proceed through each other, things that proceed through each other, whatever it may be, whatever it may be, as things then proceed through each other, 
the thing that is steering that, that's intelligence. There's an intelligence within nature. If it is, then how do you grasp it? He says, you don't think you have to grasp? Go for what's common. Right? Try to discover what's common to all. Right? And then you have to then, now he has an ethical side to himself. Right? He has a very curious and interesting ethics. He says, what you have to do is you have to learn to speak with rational awareness and thereby hold strongly to that which is shared in common. What is it that is shared in common? He says, you know what that is? That's law. Law in nature and law among men. And now, it's very interesting in his view of law, both in nature and among men. He says, men should hold on to their law in a state and defend it as much as they would fight for their own city. Therefore, you must protect it, you must preserve it, because that includes and contains the rationality. What men have brought together is a rationality. That becomes fixed in law. Your job, therefore, is to protect it and follow it. In nature, the law is the logos. Among men, it's thinking and rationality. Therefore, the law, when you're considering the law, either in nature or among men, you're really listening to what he calls, you're listening to the counsel of one. That's what he's saying. Isn't it? Law, whether it's in nature, as logos, whether it's in the rationality found among good laws among mankind, when you're obeying it, you're just obeying one. That's what you're doing. The counsel of one is what you're obeying, and that's what your mind should be fixed upon. It's because the rational, the, the soul, uh, the, the soul of man is the greatest mystery. You have to realize for Heraclitus, the soul is so interesting and yet different from uh, what most people regard it as that we must go there because we want to see how the one, right, the hidden harmony, logos, come together into the idea of the soul. Right? Ready. Next page. <clears throat> Here's a look here. Only the divine nature has real understanding. There is no understanding in man. <clears throat> Only the divine nature has it. Human nature has no real understanding. Only the divine does. Therefore, Heraclitus really has a theory of participation. Because that's what it means. It's a theory of participation. There is only intelligence in what encompasses man. See, what's around him. Right? And that's the theory of participation. He said the difficulty is that men don't understand it and they block it. And they block it, and he has a great expression to understand why men don't see this. He says, what is divine escapes men's notice? And it's only because of one thing, because of their incredulity. Pardon me? We were talking yes, yes, it's because of their basic beliefs, their incredulity, they don't believe it. That's, the, that's why they can't see. You have to know what you see before you can see it. I mean, you can't see it, you can't recognize it before you know it, but you have to know it before you recognize it, then you can see it. Right? So this is the way in which he brings you into that development. Therefore, going back now to the idea of man, man's character is his true guardian divinity. And therefore, a wise man, or the soul of a wise man, is nothing other than a beam of light from the divine. Right? That's what he calls it, a beam of light. Right? That's it. So you've got to struggle for those. Now, look here. What is this divine nature that has real understanding with which man can participate, the divine nature? Now we're going into the theology of Heraclitus, and that's where we have to go. All right, here we go. Zeus, that's what he calls it. He says, wisdom is one and unique. Wisdom stands apart from everything else. It's transcendental. It's willing, yet unwilling, to be called by the name of Zeus. 
therefore, for Heraclitus, the highest principle, the one, is nothing other than Zeus. That's willing yet unwilling to be called by the name of Zeus. Well, if that's the case, then what do we have here? What we have here, therefore, now I want to go back to remember what we said before, the idea of the soul. The wise soul, then, is a beam of light. All right. But his idea of the soul is it has no limits. It has no limits. Try as you may, he says, you can never discover the limits of the soul or the profound depths of it. By any path, he says, take all the paths you want. You can never discover the limits of the soul. Therefore, it is unlimited. His view of the soul is unlimited. <clears throat> and among the wise, therefore, it can be talked about as a beam of light. And, and therefore, it has astonishing depth. That's his view of the soul. So let's see whether we can pull things together now. He has a hidden harmony, which is a synthesis of all of the, the processes in nature, which are opposites, captured in the idea of strife. He finds behind it a principle, the logos, that creates a higher unity. It allows a theory of participation. Therefore, there's intelligence and understanding that stands apart from man, within which man may participate. And behind that is a wisdom which is one, and we have a right to call it in terms of Heraclitus, Zeus. Now, every one of these points I've gotten out of Heraclitus. Let me read you uh, a couple of them. The hidden harmony is better than the obvious. People do not understand how that which is at variance with itself agrees with itself. There is a harmony in the bending back, as in the cases of the bow and the lyre. Listening not to me, but to the logos, it is wise to acknowledge that all things are one. Wisdom is one and unique. It is unwilling and yet willing to be called by the name of Zeus. Wisdom is one to know the intelligence by which all things are steered through all things. Now, I could now multiply the other side of this where he makes fun of people who, who do not accept his view, and that multiplies his work by three or four. And I'll just read a couple of those because there, some of them are very fun. Um, Men are deceived in their knowledge of things that are manifest, even as Homer was, who was the wisest of all the Greeks. For he was even deceived by boys killing lice when they said to him, What we have seen and grasped, these we leave behind, whereas what we have not seen and grasped, these we carry away. Homer deserves to be thrown out of the contests and flogged. Hesiod distinguishes good days and evil days, not knowing that every day is like every other. Human nature has no real understanding. Only the divine nature has it. Man is not rational. There is intelligence only in what encompasses him. Uh, now, the negative side. People, they pray to images much as if they were to talk to houses, for they do not know what gods and heroes are. Night walkers, magicians, bacchanites, revelers, participants in the mysteries, what are regarded as mysteries among men are unholy rituals. So he has many of these. Uh, Although it's better to hide our ignorance, this is hard to do when we relax over wine. A foolish man is a flutter at every word. Fools, uh, although they hear, are like the deaf. To them, the adage applies that when present, they're really absent. Bigotry, sacred disease, inflicts all men. So he has all of these epigrammatic statements and they multiply the work, but they make fun of the other side by three and four. Now, if you are convinced 
by my quotes and my references to our good friend Heraclitus, I would now like to do something else. I would now like to look at Aristotle. And you are now going to be given, these are the set of terms and ideas from Aristotle. Pardon me, Heraclitus. Pass one around. Two there. So I give you one here. Come on. They don't want to come apart. Here they are. Okay. Now, most people understanding of Homer, a uh, part me of, ooh, there I go again. Heraclitus is drawn from our friend Aristotle. Now there are, these are seven of the statements drawn from Heraclitus. If this is all we have of Heraclitus, right, then you would come to certain conclusions. But if these exist, as they do in Aristotle, and these 20, 124 statements is really what exists of Heraclitus, and by the way, he was said to have had one of the great libraries in the ancient days. Then we can then continue the point we were making last week, and it's going to go on as long as we're in this series, that each time you have to give a test. And we have to grade Aristotle's understanding of his contemporary philosophers. And I think you will see as we go through this again and again and again that he's going to get very poor grades. Therefore, when people in our culture go to Aristotle as a source for understanding the pre-Socratics, we're in trouble, I think. But maybe he'll get a high grade tonight. Let's try it. Take a minute out. I'll read them together. <clears throat> All things are in motion, as Heraclitus says. <clears throat> Hippasus a metapontum. And Heraclitus of Ephesus declare that fire is the first principle. Heraclitus says that all things that sometime become fire, some such as Empedocles of Acracus and Heraclitus of Ephesus, say that there is an alternation in the destructive process which goes on now in this way, now in that, continuing without end. It is logically impossible to suppose that the same thing is and is not as something Heraclitus said. Supporters of the theory of forms are led to it by means of Heraclitus's argument concerning truth, in which he holds that whatever is perceived by the senses is in a state of flux. Accepting that much of his argument, these philosophers go on to argue that if there is to be science or knowledge of anything, there must be other entities in nature besides those perceived by the senses, inasmuch as there can be no science of what is in a state of flux. Whereas some think of uh, the like as a friend and the opposite as an enemy, others think of opposites and friends, and Heraclitus blames the poet who wrote, would that strife met must Pardon me. Would that strife might perish among gods and men, arguing that there could be no harmony without both low and high notes, and no living things without the pair of opposites, male and female. To punctuate Heraclitus is difficult because it is often unclear whether a given word should go with what follows or with what precedes it. When, for instance, at the beginning of his treatise, he says, Although this logos exists always, men are unaware of it. It's unclear whether always belongs with exists or with are aware, pardon me, are unaware. Now, <clears throat> going back, as you consider this, Aristotle is your student. He just uh, studied Heraclitus here tonight, and this is his paper on Heraclitus. This is Aristotle and Heraclitus. Pardon? Yes, this is all Aristotle on Heraclitus. These are all the quotes from Aristotle on Heraclitus. He is one of your students, and you just gave him a talk, just as I have here on the board, and he just gave you this paper as a summary of his good work, and you are now going to grade it. All right? Okay, take a minute out, give him a grade.
Aristotle. These are all quotes from Aristotle. about dealing with, presumably quoted from or references to Heraclitus. Pardon me, it doesn't say as Heraclitus says? Yeah. That's all we have. Okay. That's what Aristotle, but I don't see that here. Well, I don't mind that. But yeah, how about this point? Is this clear? This statement can be found in Aristotle. I can give you the reference okay. to it. This and it deals Aristotle. with Heraclitus. Heraclitus came here tonight, and he made these notes about the writings of Heraclitus, and I'm asking you to grade them to see how well he did in the study of Heraclitus. Okay. On the first point, it seems like it's okay since Heraclitus says everything flows, nothing abides. Sure. Yes. So? So? He gets a couple of points. A point Fine. The first one. Fine. Second one is no good, right? The logos. Everything comes from the logos, and maybe I misheard. Well, it, it, uh, the point that you're raising is this one, see? What is meant by a first principle? If the first principle is to account for nature, then he sees all things flowing out of and to, flowing into and gathering out of, that's certainly some idea that he has about what takes place in nature, but it's not the principle that explains fire. So you might say that is the first principle, fire, in nature, but it doesn't account for the dynamics found in nature, the dynamics of fire that must go behind it, as it were. So if you, pardon me? To the real first principle. Well, then there's a question, what do you want to call that thing above it and behind it? Right. He could say the first principle in nature, that would make it clearer, wouldn't it? Or in a process of nature. Right, as the next statement says, Heraclitus says that all things at some time become fire. All things can be consumed by fire, return, and come out of fire. We would say the same thing through the bursting of the sun and the... Uh, all of the planets are nothing other than spinning fireballs out of the sun at some point, and then it will likely to be caved in at some future time, and therefore everything is generated out of fire and will return to it. There is an alteration change back and forth into destructive processes which go on now in this way, now that, continuing without end. That's, that's there, isn't it? Still in nature, isn't it? He's still in nature, isn't it? Right. Still in the processes of nature. It is logically impossible to suppose that the same thing is and is not as something Heraclitus said. Well, okay. All right. Okay. Now there are three other statements, they're long paragraphs. All right, deals with the idea of the theory of forms. We're led to it by means of Heraclitus' argument concerning truth. He holds that whatever is perceived by the senses in the state of flux, and if you say that, if there's any kind of knowledge, there must be something behind it that can account for the flux. That's true, but does he tell us what forms there are behind it? Well, it's just a theory of forms. This is before Plato. It's 30 years before Socrates was born. So while that's true, does he link it to it? Does he link it to the theory of forms? All right. Third, that, all right. Whereas some think of like as a friend, the opposite as an enemy, others think the opposite as friends. All right. Then he quotes Heraclitus, blames the poet who wrote. All right, so he's just quoting from a poet at that point, is he not? Mm. 
Heraclitus thinks that this view came from this poet. All right, so. Okay. And you can uh, take the last sentence now. To punctuate Heraclitus is difficult. It's a question even whether there's a difficulty with it, but okay. Now, uh, what percentage would you say of the ideas that we were covering tonight does Heraclitus cover? 20%. He doesn't deal with the most important one, it seems like. Louder, please. He doesn't deal with the most important one. Not seems like. He doesn't deal with it. the idea that everything is one. No. Or, or that there's a beam of light. So the theology he doesn't have. Doesn't have the logos. Doesn't have, doesn't the, have the logos. Doesn't have the rational. Doesn't have the rational. Doesn't have intelligence. Doesn't have understanding. Doesn't have the idea of participation in understanding? No. Huh? Let's go back, right? Does he have any of this? No. And if these are important, and if a student failed to include them on the paper, what would you do? How about only the divine nature has real understanding? Is that an important idea? Yeah. Uh, uh. Human nature has no real understanding, only the divine does, and therefore there's by participation that we gain that. Only, since only the divine nature has it. He doesn't it. understand it because he doesn't know how to punctuate that sentence. That's right. That's very important, by the way. If he knew how to punctuate, if he understood it, he could probably know how to punctuate that sentence. Yeah. Although, if I knew how to understand it, I'd probably But he still stays at the level of nature all the way through. He never, never goes above it. Well, let's, let's take that English problem or that grammatical problem and take a look at it in a minute, all right? All right. Uh, does he also have a view of mankind? Is he continually opposing one view against the many? Does he bring that up in his uh, statements? Then he doesn't have that tension between the two that plays a major role in his thinking. So therefore that's missing as well. Huh. Uh, how about man's character as his guardian deity? Ha! Huh. And man's soul is like a beam of light. Ah, the hidden harmony. See, you have to know the intelligence by which all things are steered through all things, right? Hmm. Thinking is common to all. How about the idea of law? Was that significant? Idea of law and nature. Behind all nature is the logos. That same principle which is common to all can be found in man and law. Significant? Fight for your law as if for your own city. Right. Well, um, I don't know anything about this stuff, but part of the like chaos theory just part of it is this at all similar to that that like behind all these things that seem inharmonious that there's a harmony that's what he's saying isn't it but i mean you know that that what the chaos theory or whatever i uh, especially the whatever <laughs> yes if you're talking about chaos theory chaos theory is a way of talking about that behind chaos there's a higher degree of order that's right. And that's very similar that's to this, very or is there, yes. is there differences in it? Or? It's, well, th 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 there might be differences to it, but this is so sparse. We only have 124 quotes, and uh, there are actually only 30 quotes, and only uh, six deal with the idea of hidden harmony. It'd be difficult to set up, therefore, a direct comparison between what chaos kind of theory. people, were they mathematicians, or? This is known. No. What? Oh, no, I meant... We're talking about people, 500 B.C. But I'm saying the chaos theories that was that... Sprung like, out of mathematics. Math? Yeah, math and theoretical physics. And physics. Yeah, um. yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially at the University of Santa Cruz. All right. All right. Okay, how about this? Did you give him a grade for this, or did he miss this page? Is that Is that one? So where does he then focus? What does he focus on? There you go. Oh, not, even. not even in nature. Yeah. It's not the one, right? Doesn't see the oneness. Not even oneness. He drops out all oneness. And the transformations he does have. This is where he is, isn't he? There you go. So he, from 20 to 10 percent. Processes. In fact, 
How could this guy be Plato's disciple? I don't get it. Aristotle. Well, no, 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 no. See, that's one of the words you have to learn to use. Um, he may have been sitting in the back sleeping. No, no. See, he went to he went to the academy. He was a member of the academy, and he claimed he never did understand that great lecture on the good and the one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Where? Too bad. Poor guy. That's what he. That's what he said. That's what he said. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So now look here. Now let's go back. Now look here. I'm not sure about. Uh, Shall we collect the pages and find out how he did, or do you think we can all agree without collecting the papers what kind of a grade he received? Hmm. Or? That's what I can say. See me after class. <laughs> therefore, <laughs> therefore, we're going back to the real problem, which is this one. You see, how should we teach philosophy? Now, I think, see, if you use Aristotle to understand Aristotle, and if you're now taking Aristotle's view of Heraclitus and using that as a basis for understanding, then you have a D or an F understanding of Heraclitus. But the biggest problem, biggest problem, is the theory we mentioned last time. And let me restate it. There is an idea that there are people called pre-Socratics. Not only that they came before Socrates, but the ideas they had were not yet developed on the level of Socrates. And I would like to call to your attention the fact that would you not agree you saw many of the ideas basic to Platonic thought already in Heraclitus. Participation of one, the idea of intelligence and wisdom being one, Zeus is the highest concept, the theory of participation, that intelligence is divine and man only gains it by participating, a whole theory of participation. And therefore, I don't see any basis for arguing that there is this development going on. Rather, it looks like it's sprung full, not complete, not that Plato and other thinkers didn't add and amplify it. The difficulty is that all we have is the fragments, and the fragments themselves indicate a very deep richness where there, where there is a kinship between the Socratic, Platonic tradition and these thinkers that preceded them, especially Heraclitus. Now we have these three methods, remember? Right. Moderns go for authorities, and unfortunately, a good number of them frame their thought of Heraclitus from Aristotle. We would argue, would we not, from this, that the second method of hermeneutical method, from Proclus, Aristarchus, and Persianus, is the one that should really be used, which is if you're going to study these people, get as much as you can from them, but then look for people who have achieved the summit of their knowledge of that thinker. Right. And then, if you have, then go back to the original work with the insights you've attained and then test them. That's the second. Now, that's what Persianus did when he was studying the idea of the soul, and he went to Iamblichus, and he did that great work on the soul. That's what he did. That's the method he used. But Iamblichus and Plotinus did not use this method. They, and that's the third method, right? The third method. And the third method is most, much interesting, isn't it? Plotinus went out and he shaped his own vision by the tools of Platonic thought. And then on the basis of what he did understand and grasp through his uh, mystical encounters with mind and mind itself, he then did the work called the Aeneids. Iamblichus did the same thing. He had his own vision. He was a student of the same Platonic tradition. But he, he, he 
delved into the same thing on an experiential realm as well as understanding, so he brought his own experience plus his understanding, and on the basis of that he created the work he did. And that, therefore, uh, which, which is really interesting, he then went back and looked at Aristotle and said, I can make sense out of Aristotle better than he could himself, because I can take the fragments there and I can rework them into a much more consistent and coherent vision. But he did that because he then reached the level of experience and understanding and crafted a better Aristotle, perhaps, than Aristotle could have done. Who knows uh, whether that's accurate. But you can certainly say he added a great depth to it. Same thing with Plotinus. Now, Proclus did not. Proclus did not. It doesn't come out of his own experience. It comes out of a great deal out of Serranius. And therefore, what we want to do in the modern world, in our world, is go for three. Train people for vision, bring them back into the wisdom tradition, let them go through these works, let them take advantage of one, two, develop three, and gain and continue this wisdom tradition. And that's the goal of, I, I believe, true philosophy. Proclus didn't have experience and understanding? I didn't um, say he didn't have understanding. Okay. I that's said that his... He continuously says that he drawing on people who came before him, especially his teacher, Serenius, in the end of, uh, at the end of the Parmenides in what's called the K section, he does talk about the need for individual experience, but he doesn't bring that to us. And uh, uh, though he does acknowledge the need for it, and if you want to take a good look at it, I would recommend you looking at it. It's called the K section at the end of Proclus's commentary on Plato's Parmenides. There's a, there is a possibility of, of understanding this material without experience. I don't hear it. Without what? Without experience. Understand. That's what, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, yes, of course. Is there a way of understanding this material without experience? Yes, that's writing commentaries on what pe other people have said and thought. That's what we do in the colleges. But how can that's what they do in the colleges. No one says what you must do is sharpen your intellect to the point where you can use it as a vehicle for seeing, so you can see things similar to what Plato, Plotinus, and Proclus saw, and these people saw, and then take, their sh take that vision that you've had or that uh, experience of the nature of reality and craft it back into this tradition so you can then express what these former thinkers thought in a much more interesting and varied way, perhaps enrich it. No, we don't do that in college or university. Oh, I, yeah. okay. How could you understand Plato and not have insight? That's easy. Just go to any university and they'll bore you to death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's not understanding though, is it? Yes, it is. It's a kind of understanding. It's being able to say what well, and in, in, in many cases, you don't read Plato in many universities. The instructor will tell you what Plato says, so it's one step removed from it. But in the classes where you can do it, you're not encouraged to look for the method of Plato to explore it yourself, and then come back on the basis of some enriched experience, write a commentary on it. That's not normally done. As a matter of fact, I don't know any school where it would be acceptable, unless it was a rhetoric class or English composition. We train scholars. We don't train people for vision. Yeah, I can That's the purpose of the university. But I'm understanding that you're saying Proclus does not, didn't have the experience, or am I misunderstanding? If you read Proclus, you do not hear him, read him, you don't see in his comments that this comes from his own vision. When he does talk about people and vision, he talks about it from other people, especially his teachers. In the end of, as I said, at the end of the conclusion of the Parmenides, look at the section K, where he does talk about the need for experience and he outlines what he thinks is a method. He does not say that he exploited it on that level and went back into the text and found this and that because of that experience. You might, you might assume it, 
But Plotinus does. Plotinus says that's what he did. Right? When he the descent of the soul. Yeah, and, they, and they, uh, yes, in the descent of the soul and in many other places, and beauty on the one. He adds to it immeasurably out of his own experience. I, I'm just, I guess I'm puzzled as to even if he is quoting and he is making commentaries and using other people's um, expressions, propolis that is, that there isn't a, a degree or some kind of a level of experience that goes along with that so that it's intelligible. How can we conclude from reading a section on Proclus that whatever it is he's writing in any particular point that interests you, whether that's the basis of reflection and understanding on the text and on his teacher's texts rather than on his own experience? Contrarywise, when can you see that he's really concluding on the basis of his own private uh, experience and not driving the basis of those statements from teachers that he's worked with and studied with. You have to take a look, look. I'm not saying he doesn't, ins doesn't outline the need for experience, am I? I'm saying it is not obvious to me, it might be obvious to someone else, uh, to find sections in there where he's volunteering that this material came out of my own experience. Yeah, well, look, I'm not suggesting you give up your assumption. Yeah. I'm just saying, next time you go through it, keep mm -hmm. that in mind and see whether you can make this kind of a distinction. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. See, especially if you're thinking about the uh, Proclus' commentary on the Parmenides, a good part of his commentary on Parmenides is line by line by line by line. And the question is, what is he bringing to that under, what is he bringing to each one of those lines to open it up and to make a comment on it? Does that come out of his own experience? Does it come out of Saranicus? Does it come out of the earlier thinkers? And there's a whole set of earlier thinkers he uses. Because part of the game of scholarship is to be able to identify earlier thinkers and to master those so you can, as it were, stand at the top of that and make statements about something that came earlier. And that's one of the goals. It's a legitimate goal. It's the second method. When uh, Proclus writes about the Arche of Light, is that based upon uh, commentary on, on the section in Plato, or is, it, or is he saying this is how things are? Well, you see, now you're in your move from the Parmenides to the theology of Plato. Yeah. I that was in the well, that's where the whole, a great whole section is on uh, the procession of light. All right, okay. Again, we're back with the same question, all right? Watch. How can we conclude that some section is the result of the author's personal experience rather than the result of working with previous thinkers and their writings to make the points he made. Now, to truly conclude, we would have, he would have to say it, I suppose, but it seems obvious to me that he has that kind of understanding when I read his work. I mean, <coughs> in the introductory invocations to the theology of Plato and uh, <coughs> the commentary on Plato's Parmenides, he uh, exhorts that the gods enkindle a light of truth inside of him, inside of his soul, right? Mm -hmm. That's true. No doubt. But the, I mean, he doesn't say that it's happened. But he does ask them to do that. <clears throat> that's right. And that's why I made a separation between that kind of thinker and Plotinus, who very clearly does make that statement. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as we're concerned, all right, if we could find some examples of Proclus's work that does come out of his experience, what we'd simply do is say, part of Proclus is here and part of Proclus is in the third section. We put his name down here. Well, perfectly all right. 
there is nothing uh, in far as what I'm doing that would exclude that. But insofar as we know he does quote previous thinkers and shapes his vision from those thinkers, since that's what he tells us, to that degree he belongs here. And I'm certainly not excluding if you, if you do find some rich quotes that suggest that, put them in both. Yeah, okay, well, find them and, and uh, we'll uh, <coughs> break them into two. All right, we'll break them into two. All right, now. How 24 fragments? We pulled out about a third of them. Right? We structured them in the way in which we did in order to justify the claim that there is a wisdom of Heraclitus. That fits in, is consistent with what we later call the Platonic tradition. Therefore, I would rather call it not the Platonic tradition, but the Hellenic tradition. Now, the difficulty with that, let me make it very clear, and for that I'll even get a different color. There may be some Hellenics who don't, do not participate in that. Like and, like Aristotle? and Aristotle may be one. <laughs> <laughs> Since many of the thinkers do, we can say very clearly that there is a Hellenic tradition in which we will clearly put our friend Heraclitus, as we did with our other thinkers, and especially now when we go into Empedocles next time, He'll fit in the Hellenic tradition. We're going to do the same thing, make another test as we proceed, because if we can shake loose our tie to this gentleman, Aristotle, and then using him as a basis for understanding, then it opens up the fact that Plato was not unique, Socrates was not unique. There was something going on in the tradition, and that takes participation in and experience of, and it's still possible to get into it because that's something that is there. Well, Thank you. Maybe Aristotle was not in the Hellenic tradition. We call it the Aristotelian tradition. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Do it again. Just one more quick. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if there is a wisdom tradition oh. in Heraclitus, right, we have to find it. Mm -hmm. Because we have been the heirs of an Aristotelian tradition, the difficulty with that is that there are only 124 fragments. The ratio is one to three, sometimes one to four on these issues. And if you only focus on the negative side, then you have a distorted view of Heraclitus. He does, however, deal both in his style and his content with opposites. And when he does make these differences, they're in sharp contrast. We then talked about three methods of the hermeneutical method. All right, one, two, three. Making clear that when we're dealing with Heraclitus, depending upon which one you use, you're going to come to it with a different understanding. I started with the processes in nature because nearly all of Aristotle is in this realm. And I wanted to show that he does explore this realm, even though there are some things he misses. Right. But nonetheless, he does represent a good part of it. Right. The question then is, does he keep remain faithful to the other levels of Heraclitus, such as that there's something behind nature in that great expression, nature loves to hide and all is one. And if so, there must be something behind all of this strife that can bring about a oneness. And what is that? Right, because we can see that the idea of fire is a transformation through the elements. Right. So therefore we must have to try to look for that rationality that moves from the many and strife into oneness. That's the Logos. The Logos is what he calls eternally valid and everything flows from it and everything comes come to pass in accordance with the Logos. He contrasts his own view with that of the many. He calls the many asleep. And he says, they believe they have a private intelligence of their own. And even though they're intimately connected with this Logos, they, have no, they act as if they had no experience of it. His way of reflecting on things is such that, he says, 
done my own method. I practiced on myself. I searched myself, and I have two ways of proceeding with my method. One is that I try to study the nature of each thing and specify how it behaves. If he's going to specify how he behaves, surely then he must rely upon the senses, the eyes especially, which he must treasure above all. But he also says, apart from eyes and the ears, he treasures most often learning as central and highest of it all. all right? And therefore, he seeks to reach for this truth behind things. Well, if you do have this logos, what does that depend upon? Does it stop there? Does he go behind it? He says, good heavens, there's a hidden harmony. You have to discover it. Right? And if you do, then you'll discover the intelligence behind which the logos functions and by which all things are stirred through all things. Remember this beautiful diagram I drew? I was impressed by it myself. Then on the other side, as he goes from the logos, which is common to all in all nature, he also has the idea of a oneness in man, common to all mankind, and that's law. He says law, especially rational law. Law is something so important, it's a one, and therefore you must guard and protect your law as if you were protecting your city. For if you listen to the law, rational law, that's like listening to the counsel of one. So he ties in the idea of one to law and to nature and the hidden harmony behind it, and that's an intelligence. What's the nature of that intelligence? He says, well, I'll tell you what, man doesn't have it. He can participate in it because divine, the divine nature has real intelligence and man has none. Therefore, the only way he can gain it is by participating in it, which he expresses in a very interesting way. He says there's an intelligence only in what encompasses mankind. Right? And that's a kind of participation. Is in, in, right? And he says the problem is, what is the, what is the difficulty we have? It's only one thing. The divine nature escapes men's notice because of their own basic incredulity. They don't believe. They don't, it's their beliefs that are blocking them from vision. Therefore, if you are straightforward in your, your being and you lack this uh, incredulity, then you know what? You'll have character. What is that? Well, that's to have a, a divine guardian. For a man's character is his true divine uh, guardian. Therefore, if that's the case, then the wise man is nothing other than a soul that is nothing other than a beam of light which reflects the nature of that higher reality. Right. Then we said, look here. How does the divine nature and real understanding connected with, and with what's beyond that? Oh, he's a Zeus. So there's the theology of Heraclitus. Though he puts a caution, you know, Zeus is willing yet unwilling to, right, the one is willing yet willing, unwilling to be called by the name of Zeus. Wisdom, it can, you can call it Zeus. It, it's willing and it's unwilling to be called by the name of Zeus. Unique is the one. Unique, right? And wisdom stands apart from all else. It's transcendent. It's above and beyond all else. And therefore, it stands as a divine element, a theology above Heraclitus. Therefore, we mention further that the idea of soul is not each man has a particular soul, but the idea of soul has no boundaries. It's limitless. Therefore, it really is like a world soul of, of what later was developed in the time is with Plato. That's astonishing depth. You'll never be able to tap the depth of the soul. Then I brought these ideas together and said, now that let's look at these ideas and see whether we can talk about them and their presence in Heraclitus. And then I opened up, passed out those pages with seven statements drawn from Heraclitus. And I gave it to you to, to decide on what kind of a student he was, if this can be said to represent Heraclitus, since everything I put here on the board comes directly out of Heraclitus. And I think most people gave him a low grade, hoping that he'd come go back and do some more work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Aristotle does not appear to understand what the dialectic is. Was the dialectic something that was discussed at Aristotle sometime? Oh, well, it had to be. Well, then how can you say that things cannot be uh, so the same thing is and is not? How can he, he fail to understand that dialectically, if, no, if for no other way? Yeah, well, there is a problem with Aristotleism. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to get more of it as we go on. Okay. Right, and the big mystery is, where did he get his reputation being a philosopher? If most of us, when we read his stuff on each of these thinkers, get such a low grade. Thank you.